Hey YouTube, today we're going to talk about what are embeddings and how do we use them. I've been getting a lot of questions about this lately, so I'd like to help clear it up a bit. Classically, we have thought about the relationship between content as being the purview of ontologists and taxonomists and other search functions, but embeddings and large language models are starting to challenge this notion. First, we'll talk about what are embeddings, how are they used, and what applications do they apply to. Next, we'll set up our own embeddings using Ada from OpenAI for text search. We'll also go over some open source alternatives as well. And then finally, we'll see how well does this perform for our search. So let's get started. Embeddings in the case of machine learning are how computers understand the relationships between different types of data. For example, images or words, but they can be applied to multiple different use cases. How they achieve this is taking high dimensional data such as images, which have thousands of pixels, and mapping them to lower dimensional spaces such as spheres. TensorFlow has a wonderful tool called the TensorBoard Projector, which allows us to visualize embeddings such as this. In this case, we have the minced data set, which is a group of hand-drawn digits between zero and nine. And we would like to be able to automatically classify which number these hand-drawn digits are. So we can use embeddings to help us with this classification problem. This particular type of embedding is created by a TSNE and maps our images onto a sphere. And it's pretty apparent that these different clusters are strongly associated to different digits, though it is imperfect. There are more powerful tools that we can use, but they're difficult to visualize because humans can only see in three dimensions. So what other applications do these embeddings have? We can use embeddings for a multitude of different use cases, especially when we need to relate or classify different information. But perhaps one of the most relevant use cases today is how language models understand words and concepts. Computers don't naturally understand human language, so we have to give them a tool that allows them to be able to do tasks like finish the sentence, I have a pet. Now, Computerfile put it very well when he said, if we considered relationships and words to be alphabetical, if the model responded can, that would actually be pretty close to cat, but it would be very far away from dog. So we have to use a different tool, which is where word to vet comes in, which allows us to place words spatially and the closer words are, the more related they are. So for example, this is a 10,000 word clustering of word to vex. And so if we look at different parts of the clusters here, we can see that for example, physician, the psychologist, um, inventor, historian, these are all grouped together here as professions. If we go over to this part of the map, we can see Jeffrey, Gordon, oh, the race car driver, good. Um, Eric, Glenn, Alex, and so forth, different um, names for people. We can even zoom in on here and take a look at a word clustered closer inside. We can see understanding, thinking, thoughts, knowledge, things that are related to each other are just more closely packed. Now, modern language models use more complex embeddings alongside transformers to be able to understand more complex topics, such as the difference between the following use of server. The server brought me a cup of water versus I crashed the server. The same word, but with multiple meanings, but modern language models can use transformers alongside different embedding techniques to understand the differences between those two meanings. Now let's try an example where we can run the code ourselves. If you check the description below, I've uploaded this code with instructions on how to load the data set and start the projector. So what we'd like to do is take this data set, which is a Microsoft data set of 521 images of animals, people, chairs, and various other features that we'd like to cluster together based on how alike they are. So to do that, all we have to do is make sure we've clicked spherized data here. Otherwise, the results may be a little difficult to interpret. We want to select TS and E and then just hit run. Now you can see very quickly that the data starts to cluster together. And if we give it enough iterations, we should start getting some good discrete clusters. This takes about 600 iterations and we can go ahead and stop it and take a look at what we have. 
And if we zoom in here, we can see that we have mostly cars grouped here. Um, if we come over here, we have signs and homes over here. And then down here, we have trees and other kind of outdoors kind of scenes. And then over here, we have chairs grouped together. So these kind of systems or embeddings can be used for a multitude of different types of systems, including cameras that detect people or animals or do kind of classification problems. And if you'd like to be able to take what we've done here and modify it for different kinds of data sets, please feel free to. That's the point of the code. And please let us know in the comments below what you kind of come up with. So. Let's move on now to using ADA embeddings for uh, enhancing your search and being able to cluster like information. Before we use ADA and these other open source embedding tools, we want to understand what our inputs are and what our returns will be. In the case of ADA, it takes in at most 8,091 tokens and will return to us a 1,536 dimensional vector of floating point values. Now, I've heard some confusion about what exactly ADA returns. I've heard people say that it gives us tokens. This is not true. Instead, it gives us a positional vector and floating points, so we can store that in a vector database or some other store for later retrieval. So, and that's gonna be true for any of these particular models, including the open source ones. And so if we want to try querying ADA, let's see what we get back. And in this case, if we look here, we do indeed get a 1,536 dimensional vector back. And this allows us to know in space where our document is and be able to cluster other similar documents around it for search. This is the same for if we use Hugging Face and the codes for this are also in the description if you'd like to try them out. So how do these allow us to search? Well we can leverage asking questions, which we will also embed and search with our vector database with. And that's what this code is meant to do. And it is also uploaded as well, but it does come from just OpenAI's cookbook. So you can grab it from there as well. But in this case, we can just ask questions. For example, who were the women uh, gold medalists? And instead of just performing search, we can also leverage ChatGPT or other large language models to help us summarize the data. So we don't have to go through and read through everything. Instead, we just get all of our results. So in this case, ice hockey, we had Canada for freestyle skiing. We had uh, Shu Min, Min Tao. Eileen Yu, Eileen Yu for Big Air and Half Pipe. We had Matilda Grimaud for Slope Style and Moguls, uh, Jakara Anthony, and so forth. So we could also ask who were the men's champions. We could ask what particular people from Europe, what people from North America, and so forth. Um, and this is just meant to really empower our ability to have much more performance search than we have had in the past. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe, and please let us know in the comments what you'd like to hear next. And please tune in next time for when we're going to be talking about vector databases and how to use them for your application.